Uh, we're thrilled today to be joined by three physicians who are some of the most passionate people I know about achieving heart recovery. We'll have Dr. Jane Wilcox, the section head of heart failure at Northwestern, and the NPI for our BTR EFS study, as well as Dr. Manry Canwar, section head of heart failure at Allegheny General Hospital and a founding member of the Cardiogenic Shock Working Group. And unfortunately, due to some unforeseen conflicts, Dr. Beacon Bosker is not able to join us. And Dr. Bart Maines is kind enough to join us and give us his surgical perspective as the chairman of cardiac surgery at Leuven. So thanks, Bart. So, so to start off, I uh, wanted to ask each of you, how are you approaching heart recovery in your clinical practice? And in the spirit of A-Cure, when do you decide to use unloading as part of your strategy to achieve recovery, not just replacement? So Jane, if you want to start. Yeah, I think, um, I think of recovery as obviously very broad. Um, you know, I have a large clinical practice of outpatients with myocardial recovery, uh, which we're not talking about today. <laughs> but I think that dovetails nicely into the discussion about outpatients who have the dwindles, right? The class 3B patient, the class ambulatory class 4, I'm a heart failure specialist and I still don't have a, I still can't, you know, I might pimp somebody on rounds, but I, I don't have a great way of, Tedford, you're laughing here, <laughs> I like, don't have a great way of, of identifying who those patients are, right? But we all sort of know who they are. Um, you're, deep, you're down titrating medical therapy, or perhaps you're not able to escalate medical therapy in a de novo heart failure patient. And so those patients who end up coming in with chronic worsening heart failure, you do a right heart cath, you know, the wedge pressure is 30, you're amazed, um, you know, either index is low. Um, you know, we're always, we think about advanced therapies in that patient population. But the discussion, at least at Northwestern and, or in our practice, is first, is there something else that we can do? Can we optimize them more? Um, you know, th that's the sort of perfect patient that comes in that that's, isn't crashing and burning, right? Um, oftentimes what we're doing is we're sort of deciding, can we, can we prehab this patient? Can we make them a little better to achieve myocardial recovery? And if we don't achieve recovery, then we kind of jump parallel paths to VAT and transplant. So we kind of do things in parallel. But I always, I think about the young patient, I think about the patient who's got relatively preserved global longitudinal strain, the patient who hasn't, um, you know, hasn't really seen an ARNI um, in the outpatient setting, um, hasn't, hasn't seen high dose beta blocker, can we unload them temporarily, get them on GDMT, and try that for, you know, we're all in the constraints of the financial, at least here in the US, right, of length of stay issues, things like managing your, the time the patient's in the hospital versus the end goal of them leaving the hospital, hopefully with their own heart. Uh, there's a lot of competing priorities, but we always try to say, is there something else that we could do um, temporarily unload them if they haven't achieved, haven't sort of got that box check of other, you know, um, uh, neurohormonal antagonists. So someone who's never seen Arnie, that's, that's usually a, a trigger for me to try to use mechanical unloading, get them on um, Arnie compound, and if I can't, then, you know, we, we sort of jump the path, but um, we, we always try. Great, thanks. Henry? So, so I'll try to add to that without repeating what Jane said. So I think even though we're heart failure cardiologists, all we do is try to practice recovery in our clinics, in our ICUs, in our VAD patients, um, every which way we look at it from GDMT to CRT to whatever it is, it's all about recovery. We may I not love call it, it that. CRT. And then, um, it's the best. so, you know, I would answer it as it's, at my program, it's a philosophy that every shock patient, whether they have, um, you know, ischemic, non-ischemic milieu, is the first question is not can we wear or transplant them. The first question is how do we recover them. And, you know, go, at the same time, you have to start looking at other options. You know, you can't be saying, well, I'll wait for, you know, two weeks and then start thinking about it but the driving force is recovery, not replacement. And when you start off with that, then you think like that. And we, you know, I have, I have eight heart failure faculty that work with me, and none of us uh, works the other way because that's how we've done things. 
to um, to elaborate on what Jane said, you know, I, I would say I'll take it a step further. Even durable VAD patients, when we present a patient for durable LVAD, we we start with the likelihood of recovery, not just to say DTBT. Everybody gets scored, whether it's writing is on the wall, they will never recover, but that doesn't mean you don't. Every patient gets started on GDMT because recovery is not yeah. in durable VAD just about explant. It's about learning how to recover these patients with unloading, which will then allow us to spill into you know, the shock patients. So re in, in reference to cardiogenic shock, I think active LV unloading in the setting of a cardiogenic shock I think is, is pretty no-brainer. But the philosophy behind that is to see if, if if we can find a trigger as to what they went into, why, why they went into a shock, and is that trigger reversible? And if it is, you know, that is what you pursue. It takes time, patience, persistence, and often we don't succeed, but I would say it starts with the philosophy, and the philosophy is recovery, whichever way we look at it. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, confirm this. Uh, besides the fact, of course, with the surgical view that I'm looking more at the acute shock patients on one side and the VAT patients on the other side. I don't have the experience that you have in the patients in an earlier stage. But in the acute shock patients, it's, yeah, as we have learned uh, today uh, about ECMO, Impella, and then trying to go for recovery, where for us surgeons, the auxiliary approach and expanding time uh, is a big uh, asset for, uh, since the last years. And in the VAT patients also, with the same philosophy as uh, you just said, Manreed, so the first six months, for instance, we never transplant the patient. So the goal is recovery. So uh, we never transplant the patient, and after six months, then we reanalyze, follow BNP, follow all the protocols that are needed, uh, and try to go for recovery. And actually, I have a question on this point, uh, where maybe you guys have more, more experience of, or other people in the room. That is, if we are with VAT patients, six months later and everything is going well, BNP is down, ejection fraction is better, we all use this rule that the ejection fraction should be 40% in order to wean from an LVAT. And I have difficulties measuring this reliably. So I just wanted to know if somebody can advise me here how you measure this correctly. With an echo, um, sorry. So, so I find I the echo very difficult. So I think you know the forty percent is rather arbitrary and is a starting point. You know, it is not to say if it is forty only, then shall you do so. You know, at least at my center we do a combination of pro BNP, uh, an exercise-based stress test, an echocardiogram, and then hemodynamic parameters, both on fully loaded and unloaded uh, parameters. But I think, again, to answer your EF question at, the, at their baseline set speed, if the EF doesn't even look like it's remotely 40, then we typically don't get excited about explant. That doesn't mean they haven't recovered, hmm. but I think explant is it's a little harder to... Yeah, that's exactly yeah. the question. So when you have to make that decision, we're gonna explant it. I mean, you want, you want proof, you want certainty. And, and some of these patients are not so... The echo is not always that great because the apex is not visual, visualized well and so on, but you go for echo. So, so in that spirit, I would ask you, I would ask each of you, um, given your pursuit of heart recovery and the devices that you have available to you today, what is it that you need in the innovation space to be able to recover more patients? And what features um, do you feel would benefit you to be able to wean the patient better, uh, better support the patient, and achieve recovery in more of your patients? So I think the first thing we need is a little bit more information, a lot more information, and whom is, who is the patient, not just based on their demographics, you know, young, non-ischemic, non-dilated, that's, that's sort of a good starting point. Then some imaging and our, you know, response parameters, for example, how have they responded to the active unloading that the MCS device is providing them, how is their RV looking, and so on and so forth, and is it allowing us to titrate some medical therapy versus, and again, what is the etiology as best as we can. The next it, I thing it would be nice is if we could have tissue confirmation to say this person has such degree of fibrosis or whatever else it may be, 
that by doing a biopsy, preferably an RV biopsy, we can say we can predict the likelihood of recovery. I think that's where I would say the next step is. But in, in response to your question, what temporary MCS devices, I think the key will be duration uh, of support. Because if we only have to give them 14 days to recover or get transplanted, uh, except, you know, it, it may not just be enough time. And so this, it would be great if we had longer time with less, of course, adverse events that come with being on temporary MCS devices. That would be the ideal combo for me. So I'll dovetail, oh, am I on? I'll dovetail on what Manreet said, uh, which is brilliant. So we need, from the device, it has to be a stable platform. So we use the 5.5. It's stable, axillary, patients are upright, they're walking around, they're, they're, they're getting their bodies better, right? Um, and you know, their, their renal function's improving, they can breathe better, their, their, everything is better about them. Um, what we need is, so, the, so that stable device, number one. Number two, that point of trajectory is really, really important. So kind of what's happening, not only with the hemodynamics, but what's happening with intrinsic heart function as we're you know, on support for two weeks or even longer. The third thing that is sort of the elephant in the room for, at least in the US with our allocation system, is that we need to, the, the incentive has to be recovery. Right now I don't have a lot of incentive from my hospital, from my, um, you know, payers from, you know, whoever ranks US News and World Report based on the number of transplants you do or VADs you do. Um, the incentive is not aligned, which doesn't mean that we don't target it because it's the right thing to do. As doctors, we have to do the right thing. But I think those three things have to be um, in place. I, I think you bring up a, a great point. We've heard about the perverse incentives of heart transplant and replacement therapy. And certainly in the US, that is much of their financial incentives for advanced heart failure centers. And there's, there's not the same financial incentive to recover patients. So, so how, how do you face that barrier, both within your own hospital and your administrators, as well as within your teams? And I know, Manreet, when I visited your team, it, was, it is really part of the culture you have, and every member of your team uh, is passionate about achieving recovery first. So, so how have you been able to overcome that? I haven't. Um, I, you know, it, it's a constant struggle. I wish I could tell you it doesn't bother me. Uh, we've had this year the lowest number of transplants we've done since I started at AGH 11 years ago, but the highest number of people we've recovered. So on be it temporary devices, be it, you know, our, our cardiac, um, our cardiogenic shock patient recovery has never been better. Our outcomes have never been better. Our ECPR protocols, our ECMO survival, has crossed 70% with just a singular theme is careful patient selection. The price we are paying for that is lesser numbers. But I, I, I don't know how to change that, I wish I did, but I just say so be it, you know, so. You bring up, I'm just thinking about that, the fourth thing we need from industry, sorry. <laughs> um, so when we think about is, is pushing the field forward, right? So if we have more data, like unload, we're talking about, you know, actually studying patients who are a little bit upstream in cardiogenic shock, but really those dwindly patients, the walking, the walking lactate that's elevated, you know, we all have care for those patients. That type of um, intervention, I think, is gonna be really important in how we do that. That platform is gonna be really important, um, the getting trajectories. I, I'm curious as to the audience's, um, you know, thoughts around um, the trial design. I know, I know we talked about it earlier, but I think you know we're here. We might as well get some ideas on on how we can um, you know move the field forward. So, what would that trial look like for you, Jane? If you could design a trial, the, that, yeah. what would that be, and how would that look? So, so for me, I'm just thinking about the patients that come into my center. Right? They come in with chronic worsening heart failure, but it's like they're slit. They've slid into cardiogenic shock. They have a CP in place. A lot of times they have hemolysis with the CP and we're escalating to the 5.0 for a more stable, stable platform. So I do wonder if maybe we need some strategies that allow us flexibility um, in, that, um, in that sort of 
you know, in, in our armamentarium because that's what we're doing clinically. And then I would really want to look at those points of trajectory over time. The goal of obviously being able to explant them and they walk away into the sunshine and you know their heart is 50 per their EF is 50 percent as glorious, but in reality, really the goal is to get them out of shock, out of the throes of shock, um, on a little bit of GDMT, and you know, you know they haven't died, <laughs> and their their you know remission is a is a reasonable goal as well. So I think looking at those those trajectory points with um, you know, global longitudinal strain with echo, with metabolomics, getting getting a signal of recovery. Because right now we just are, at least I'm kind of flying a little bit by the seat of my pants in terms of, you know, if I have a trajectory that's positive, I follow it. If I end up where I can't go any any longer, I look for a clinical trial, or I move to that parallel pathway of that and transplant. And I think to add to that, in my clinic practice, if we improve the EF from 20 to 30, we we say that's pretty good, and our standards get so different when we're talking about these patients. We're like, well, it's only 10% rise, and you know, so on and so forth. So to add to your question, Bobby, in that trial, the endpoints would have to be carefully selected. They can't be something like hospital discharge, survival to hospital discharge, because we are reversing their life course potentially. So it will have to be just, not just what is their EF at discharge or were they dead or alive, but then also what happened to them afterwards? Were they able to, these are gonna be long-term trials. Do they you know, not get re-hospitalized? Do they not end up getting advanced options? At least in you know, some, some time frame that, that is manageable. So I think it's a short-term investment, but a you know, long-term goal we'd be looking for. Yeah. I just wonder, the time frame, because we are aiming now at a study for the auxiliary approach and a transvalvular valve. Huh? That's what we are talking about mm -hmm. now. So the, the question that, of course, what I referred to before on, on recovery was with implantable vets, and there we have learned that it takes about six months, six to nine months, to see the optimum of recovery. So I just want you know, to make the general question, how long do you want the time to be is six, it, is six months realistic? But is it also technically realistic? Do we see difficulties with six months from a technical point of view? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, that's sort of the, the other elephant in the room, right, is how long is someone going to be hospitalized with a temporary device um, to, you know, before you start to see that signal? When do you jump ship? What is that time? What are your incentives? Um, you know, you look at the VA, at VAD data, the, you know, LVAD data it can take up to six months to nine months to a year. You look at, I think this is published or will be published shortly, but you look at the ARNI compound data um, and myocardial recovery, that actually takes up to a year as well. Um, and so, and then, uh, you know, I think I'll stop there. Okay, so this, <laughs> I don't want to say anything I'm not supposed to. So you look at those those two ends of the spectrum, It's it it's sort of, we can't be, um, we would be ignorant to think that it's not going to take that same amount of time for someone in the middle, right? And so then now we have to think about, you know, BTR, for example, is, which is why I'm so passionate about BTR. This is a platform that allows you time, um, longer time, um, that stable platform, and then GDMT titration. And so um, getting from here to there obviously sounds a lot more, a lot simpler <laughs> so to, than, um, than, than yeah. you know, ending so, up in the middle, but uh, it's just, it's, it's so, so important. To, to answer Bobby's question, what do we need from industry? And we are here with the industry. So we need a device that can be placed transvalvularly. The patient should be able to be discharged home. Yes. Then, yeah? and, it, and we're talking about the time spectrum of, let's say, Nine months? Nine to 12 months, yeah. Six to 12 months. So the only thing I would add to that is we are talking about it takes a bad six, nine to 12 months to achieve a recovery greater than 40%. We don't have to achieve normalization of LV. We are just getting to a point where the Remission. LVs are unloaded, their GDMT is tolerated. Absolutely. So they left with an EF of 30, you know, that's- That's, that's a win, that's, that's still a win. win. Exactly, that's, yeah. we've saved them a transplant, that's a win. So, so and, in that and, spirit, and how important is weaning to help you once you get to that phase? 
um, how important is weaning to help guide what, when you wean, you know, the sensors, what information do you need to be able to guide those decisions once you can transition patients? So I would extrapolate from what we know or what little we know for de-escalation in the acute cardiogenic shock sort of spectrum because I don't know what weaning in six months would look like. I would assume, again, some measure of res the contractility reserve, ability to tolerate GDMT, why they were in shock output. if that's been if that's been reversed so far, and end organ. I mean, I'm assuming the end organ function by that has normalized, but it will be a combination of clinical echo and hemodynamic parameters, and then a slower wean as opposed to what we do currently in our ICUs, I would imagine. Yeah. I, I like the idea of, I mean, obviously using the smart pump, right? Looking at intrinsic pulsatility, looking at, you know, when is the right time? I, I wanted to ask the question uh, about, you know, why didn't we why didn't we wean ECMO on day five instead of day, day seven? And maybe at our center, I'm, fine to say this, but you know, if it's Saturday, we'll probably just wean on, you know, <laughs> if not a lot of people are around, we'll take it out on Monday. So using, but using the smart pump, right? Using that pulsatility, using intrinsic cardiac output, um, you know, kind of ramping down, checking hemodynamics, ramping back up. If we're able to do that with the smart pump, I think, um, you know, that's that stable platform, being able to go home, dischargeable, anticoagulation is figured out. Um, that's the future. That's what we need. Just figure that out for us. And yeah, but I, it, yeah. I think the big advantage of the impeller device in weaning is that you can actually run it down to almost no flow. So you really get a feedback yeah. as a physician that it will work uh, in contrast to other vets. Another advantage is as well that you did not core the apex and you, do, you preserve all muscle that is uh, possibly there. The concern that I still have for, as a surgeon from a technical point of view that just imagine that you keep the pump in for a year, that I don't know if it will come out safely without problems of attachments and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, and, and you certainly alluded to this in your conversation about how do you identify who's a recoverable patient? And unfortunately, we don't have an easy biomarker like a BMP that would tell us this patient's recoverable. And certainly talking with Doug Mann, he has mentioned the role of metabolomics, proteomics, and can we mm -hmm. develop that fingerprint that would tell us who is a recoverable patient? So as we look at clinical trials moving forward, where do you see a role of metabolomics, proteomics to help us better understand who is that recoverable patient? So I think the first step for that has already been taken by Stavros's crew where we basically had five centers all gather our apical, ap apical cores, um, matched them, you know, control-based, and sent it all to him to figure out, can he, using proteomic analysis, figure out who's gonna be recovered or not, and then you match that with, you know, demographics, echo parameters, et cetera, and then you have a little bit better recipe for success. So I think that may be the first step, but beyond that, I, I doubt it's the answer is gonna be a biomarker. I think it's going to be a complicated answer with a bunch of. I agree. Response. I think we. I don't know why I'm going to pick on Ryan Tedford, but he's smart. So, <laughs> you see somebody in clinic, right? And you, it's your brain. You, just because you don't know if they're going to recover or not, doesn't mean you don't try, right? You see, you're given the, a third, a third, a third. We're going to try. We're going to put you on GDMT. Some we're going to send you to our medication titration clinic. You might get better. You might not. But good news is, we'll we have other tools in our armamentarium. You, even when you're having that conversation with patients, your, your brain is sort of saying, gosh, they've got a genetic cardiomyopathy that is not likely to recover, or they have a genetic cardiomyopathy that's likely to recover, like Titan. They've got really good blood pressure. Um, they've got those, those, those kind of clinical hints that we know in our kind of brain that we think, oh gosh, this person is probably gonna recover. You put that into, like Menreed said, you know, biomark biomarker data, but really it's it's tissue data, um, imaging data. I'm getting to the question at some point, <laughs> but um, you you put all of that together, and that's actually that's machine learning, right? So it's it's a little bit of supervised learning. There's unsupervised and supervised learning. 
but you kind of put the things that we think are important, we put that into statistical learning, deep phenotyping, and that's kind of, I, I think, where we will end up identifying the patient that we think is, you know, has a, has a better recovery signal. Because um, right now, I, I don't know um, if anyone has any other, you know, any better ideas, but I kind of feel like we have a gut check of who might recover, at least in the outpatient setting. In the inpatient setting, in the throes of you know early cardiogenic shock, it's just I think it's a little too um, too nuanced. That was, that was, uh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I could uh, ask Bart uh, a question related to kind of the issue that you brought up, right? Because Jane just articulated very nicely that it's it's still difficult to predict who's going to so recover, and so you have a device that's in for nine to twelve months and then they ask you to take it out and you're gonna to have to surgically reconstruct that area. Do we worry, given the unpredictability of who's gonna recover, that we're gonna lose future access for the devices when they, when they come back in, again in shock, and then we need to bridge them to the next advanced therapy? And are there ways that we can mitigate that, that risk of you know, kind of permanent damage to the axillary artery where we, we can't put Annapella back in? Right. Well, yeah, I, I still envision that we're going to go through the axillary artery, and I, well, we didn't do it so far, but I would, and I would go to the same spot and try to take it out, and and hope that we construct the damage that that we do locally. Um, I don't know, Mark, We're if you have another idea up. about how to tackle the problem. Uh, I was just going to say go to the left side, but I mean, like, you've got a lot of devices there, but we haven't had issues going. We, we'll still go left um, a lot of times as well. Claudius? I think one of the challenges, uh, and I'm going to push Bart um, a little bit on this, it, you know, we, we use a fair number of axillary balloon pumps, and we use a fair number of, of subclavian and axillary 5.5s. Five and what we've learned is, First of all, the balloon pumps, the mechanical reliability, they blow up all the time. Um, for the other percutaneous or surgical axillary approaches, when we explant them at the time of transplantation, 100% of them have laminar thrombus extending through all of that area. So what would an engineering solution look like in, in your mind that would avoid that issue that is durable enough as Ryan said, not to trash the vascular axis and stable for for the for these types of indications. Yeah, I think I think you're right. The danger is, and for sure, if a catheter is for mm -hmm. so long in in the bloodstream, there will be a sheet around it, or there will be thrombus that is formed in the meantime. Um, so I can. This is brainstorming here, but what I would do is I would free up the vessel, the axillary artery. Um, first of all, do a mm -hmm. CT scan before that we know how much danger uh, is there, and then hope that if we pull out the, the, the cannula, that it that the whole uh, tissue that is around the cannula comes with it, a little bit like you do a uh, embolectomy, uh, and protect the distal artery by putting a clamp. This is what I would do now. But I'm open for better suggestions by anybody that, that wants to, to help on this. Great, well, I think we're unfortunately out of time. So Arvin, you can uh, choose somebody for a, a question. I just wanted to make a, a question and a comment was, you know, about, um, it's, it's approaching now, uh, almost 10 years ago, we did um, an experiment with the Circulate device and Bart was kind of the leader of this, uh, clinical effort, and we were kind of addressing the patients, Jane, that you were talking about, exactly where there were three Bs, you know, they were not, they were not LVAD, they were not really quite LVAD for the most part, some of them were, but we did almost 100 patients, the, I mean, the device had issues, but we treated almost 100 patients, and I think there were two patients that recovered. So what's the difference now between then, between then and now, which I think is really, really critical, is GDMT has advanced so much. So I think, I think one thing I'm just kind of this discussion makes me think about is that unloading by itself is maybe not gonna be enough to get to the numbers that we want. 
Right. But it's the ability to take these to patients it. And, and put them on the GDMT. Yeah. And I think, that's a, I think that's an important lesson, at least, that we could learn from, from the, one of the lessons that we could learn from the Circulite experience. And I think that's what Rematch taught us. Oh, sorry. You know, the, the, the durable VAT plus GDMT combo was the winner, not just unloading or just GDMT. So I think we've heard today, and thank you all for sharing your experiences, that we still have a lot of work to identify who's a recoverable patient, to develop those best practices, and we still need a smarter pump that's able to go home. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work for us to, to do in the next year and present next year at A-Cure, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you.